Welcome to another edition of the Do This Sell More show. I'm your host, Dave Lorenzo. And today we have a very special guest. Today, it is my honor to be speaking with John Tabas. He's the founder and CEO of the Books Company. Now, if you're not familiar with the Books Company, I don't know where you're getting your flowers, but if you care about the environment and you want to be hip, this is the place to go for your flowers. Let me tell you about John and then... I want him to tell us about a little experience he had on a show called Shark Tank. So John's a proven brand leader, and he's a startup creator with deep experience in innovative media ventures and consumer products. He's the founder of Books, and his co-founder, Juan Pablo Mantupar, is, uh, they, they, they launched the company, it's based in Marina Del Rey. Juan Pablo, if I'm not mistaken, and John can correct me, is the the guy behind the sourcing of the flowers, and he's originally from Ecuador, which is near and dear to my heart because that's where my wife's family is from. This brand is incredibly hot right now, and as I said, they were they were on Shark Tank, and John's going to tell us all about his experience, but their their position in the online floral space is that they deliver flowers fresh from eco-friendly, sustainable farms around the world directly to your doorstep. So, John, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about you and you and uh, Juan Pablo. I guess he goes by JP. Tell us about how you guys got together and, and why you decided to get into uh, this business. And then we'll hear about Shark Tank. Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much for for having me on. Really appreciate it. So uh, JP and I met as uh, as freshmen in college at uh, at Notre Dame. Go Irish! And um, we uh, we we formed a friendship around a, a band that we started. So we started like a um, half comedy, half music band called Sexual Chocolate as sophomores. And uh, we were not great musicians. But we were good at marketing, and we had a we had a really good time, and became really close friends. And JP actually grew up in Ecuador, as you mentioned, uh, working a dairy farm, and his uncle owned a rose farm just down the street. And just as a, as a young child, he uh, he he formed this passion for the flower industry and for farming. And so he knew that he wanted to be a farmer even as a teenager. And and flowers was sort of a growing industry, and his uncle had a farm, and so he knew that he wanted to work in in that industry even as a teenager which we all thought was super weird because we were 19 and we were like, you want to be a, a far, flower farmer? That's so strange. Um, but lo and behold, he, he was a biochemist by trade. He uh, studied, he did research for a little while, got his MBA, went back to Ecuador and was running a farm. And he got this idea of shipping directly to florists because he was seeing that they were investing heavily in people and in, in the planet. And the florists had no idea that that was happening because there were so many layers between his farm and the end buyer of the product. And so he, he came to me because I'm a marketing and a brand guy with background at Disney and, and Bain and & Company. And he was like, hey, I'm, I'm a biochemist. How do I think about getting people to care about what we do here at the farm level and, and how can I market that? And he taught me about all the positive externalities that come with running a farm in the right way around reduced waste and sustainability and, and less impact on the planet and the people. And I thought it was really fascinating and all these great things were happening. Um, I sort of had my eyes set on launching something at some point and when I looked in the floral industry, I saw this $100 billion global category with not a single large aspirational brand in it. If you think about any other category, coffee, Starbucks, media, Disney, go, go down the list of consumer categories, there's always a large and very aspirational and sort of inspiring brand at the top of the pyramid. And in flowers, it doesn't exist. You're talking about a $100 billion category where the largest player in the US is a billion dollars. And I would argue that the 1-800-Flowers brand is not sort of setting the pace in terms of consumer innovation, whereas a Disney or a Starbucks absolutely is. And so I thought, I, he saw an opportunity to really change the way this industry worked for farmers, and that's where his passion lied. And I saw this opportunity to build a brand in a space that is massive, was just was missing that sort of category defining brand, and what a cool opportunity to try to build one. And so we put our, our respective talents and backgrounds together, and we launched Books in 2012. That's great, what a terrific story. All right, so our viewers love Shark Tank, and they love to hear the Shark Tank story. We had uh, we had on Steve Sashin, who's the CEO of Zero Shoes, and he had a great Shark Tank experience story. Tell us your Shark Tank experience story 
um, because we recently, in fact, my kids who are really young came to me and they said, oh, you're talking to the guy from Books. We just saw that Books was one of the brands that the Sharks regret they didn't get in on early. So you got to tell us, give us from A to Z your Shark Tank experience. How did you get on? What happened? And what did, what did you think of the advice the Sharks gave you? Sure, yeah. So Shark Tank, first of all, if you're an entrepreneur, or if you have a small company, getting on Shark Tank is probably the best thing that could ever happen to you. Um, one, they're great people. The people that run the show, the sharks themselves from my limited interaction, the producers, everyone there is just great people. Um, and it's an amazing platform for any brand to get in front of customers. And so highly recommend that if you're considering applying, you apply. It's one of the gifts that keeps on giving. We had a rerun last night. Oh, Didn't wow. know it was going to happen. All of a sudden, thousands of people are on the website ordering, ordering, ordering. And that happens, you know, three, four times a year. And it's just free marketing and, and free publicity, which is so amazing. And so, and like I said, really great people. So um, Shark Tank got on my radar. I was I was actually at ABC, well, Disney's corporate strategy group, and, and we're doing some marketing work with ABC when Shark Tank went on the air. And so was a fan from the very beginning, loved the show, was was a regular watcher. Um, I, I was a DVR watcher because my wife wasn't a big fan, so I'd watch it sort of on the side. And um, and it got on my radar to apply because there was a um, there was a, a UCLA Anderson listserv. My I'm an alum of, of Anderson here in LA, and um, one of the fellow, my fellow alums sent out a note saying, "Hey, Shark Tank's looking for early stage startups that have raised some money. They're essentially they were diversifying the types of companies they were having on the show. And this is back in 2013, so this is a long time ago. And um, at the time, they were all pretty much exclusively moms and pop shops out of garages, out of the living room kind of companies. And they wanted to bring some other types of companies on board. And so I, I got the contact information and you know reached out to the producers through that email. And they were like, great, this is exactly what we're looking for. You should apply. And so we did the whole process, which is pretty rigorous. You know, There's an application. You have to fill out a whole bunch of forms. You have to do a video. And they bring you in. They interview you and all that kind of stuff. So we got through that process. And uh, they wanted us on the show, which was really exciting and interesting. At the same time, it was kind of scary. And so I wasn't immediately going to go on the show. I sort of spent some time thinking about it because my concern was being a company that had already raised money. We had raised a $1.7 million seed round at that point. And our company was worth, you know, close to $10 million at that time. And so unlike the regular mom and pops that go in where there's no established valuation, I couldn't actually negotiate our price. Our price was set by people that had written some pretty big checks into an established round. And I'd seen the folks who wouldn't negotiate on the show and the sharks don't like those folks. You know, like when they say, you know, oh, you're just here to get the publicity and this and that, and it becomes really awkward and then they get frustrated. And I didn't want to be that guy. Like I felt like that'd be embarrassing for the company. It'd be embarrassing for me personally. So I debated it for a while but ultimately decided to go on the show because again, I'm such a big fan of it. What better opportunity would we have to get in front of lots of people to talk about our story? Um, and, and the producers really wanted us you know, to come on the show. And so ultimately decided to do it. Uh, what was nice about well, that is I live three miles from the Sony lot where they film the show. So whereas for I think everyone else that was filming with me, they had traveled from lots of places. They had been in hotels for five days. I woke up, got in my car, drove five minutes, pulled on the lot and was like ready to go. Um, so it's pretty easy for us being, you know, native to, to LA. And then, you know, it's, it's sort of like, uh, it's, it's real TV show. What, what a lot of people don't know is that it's not sort of pre-planned. You don't have time with the sharks before you go on the air. When you see people walk into the tank, that is the first time they walk into the tank. They have not been on the set. They haven't met any of the, uh, any of the sharks. There's no sort of, prep other than um, producers giving you feedback on your first two minute pitch. And so, you know, you, when you get there, you do the, the hair and the makeup, you get dressed and you wait in your little trailer thing. And then you walk on the stage and, and that is, that is the real experience. Now, one of the things that's really unique is people spend a lot of time in there. So my, I filmed for an hour and 45 minutes and my segment ended up being seven minutes. So they take what is a very long and sort of, far reaching conversation and they really narrow it down to a really tight nugget. Um, and so uh, I was in there for an hour and 45 minutes. We went in lots of different directions. We went deep into like public equity value, public equity valuation, why books should go public or not, what our strategic opportunities would be um, sort of driven by Mr. Wonderful because he felt like our valuation was so high that if 
that our only choice would ever be to go public. And I had to remind him of all the many, many, many ex exits that happen in, in startups that happen between 50 and $300 million and they don't go public. But we had a far ranging you know, conversation and then they cut it down to you know, a seven minute segment. And ultimately I got roundly rejected by all the sharks. Barbara hated our name. Uh, Mark didn't like that we raised money from Silicon Valley investors. He thought it was a big bubble. Um, I don't remember what Robert said, um, and uh, and and Lori. Oh, oh uh, I think Robert was the speed of delivery, um, uh, and, and Lori. I can't remember what Lori what Lori dinged us on, but but across the board, completely rejected. And Mr. Wonderful even said that he'd send flowers to my grave, um, which was pretty. I actually like complimented on the joke in in real time. They didn't show it on TV, but I was like, that was that was good. It was pretty pretty good joke. Um, and uh, and so yeah, we were we, we filmed in you know I think it was like August or September of 2013, and then it aired in late April of 2014, right before Mother's Day. Um, and we it aired, it was great, and and we just saw our website metrics just go insane. I mean, from a couple hundred people on the website at a given time to 38,000 people um, on a by second basis on our website, and so it just shows the power of of shark tank to really drive people to a website we sold out of everything in about five hours we were inundated with emails and facebook messages and twitter messages and we just couldn't keep up we were a total company of seven at the time it was complete pandemonium um and then and then it was about how do we keep and and, and do a good job for those customers and um and we you know we we really were stretched to our max because we were just such a tiny company but shark tank was was pretty amazing you know Three years later, then um, Robert Herjavec called me out of the blue. Um, I was I was waiting for a three o'clock meeting. It was two fifty nine. I'll remember it for my entire life. And my phone rang. It was a number I didn't recognize. So I figured it was my three o'clock call, which was supposed to be with a vendor or something. And it's like, hey John, this is Robert from Shark Tank in his like best Robert Herjavec TV voice. And uh, I was like. Oh, hi, Robert. <laughs> What's up, man? You know, it was so strange because he didn't, he didn't have an assistant reach out. He didn't schedule a meeting. He just got my cell phone number from someone and called me, which was so cool. And that's so Robert. And, uh, and we started talking and he was like, Hey man, I'm getting married to Kim Johnson from Dancing with the Stars. And I've been getting quotes for wedding flowers and they're outrageous. And I don't understand how this business can be this way. I remember you guys from your pitch. I loved it even though I didn't invest and I'd love to see if you could help us with our wedding flowers. And so began this weekly conversation with Robert and Kim about their wedding. And ultimately we were able to save him a ton of money on his wedding flowers. And in so doing, I educated him a ton about the industry and how it all worked. And it just so happened we were in the process of closing our series C funding, which is $24 million. To date we've raised $55 million for the business. And, uh, and he joined that round. So uh, we were actually on Shark Tank and on 2020 as sort of the one that got away as your, as your kids mentioned about a year after that because we helped him save so much money. He got so excited about the business that he wanted to put money in the business after all. So you were, you were a huge winner because of your Shark Tank experience. That was, that was a huge win for you and your company. Fantastic win. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, I was reticent to go on it because of those concerns now that I've been on the show, it's the great, it's the greatest thing. It really is. It's a great entertainment show. I love it as a consumer of it, but as a business person with a, br a consumer brand, there is no better marketing platform. You get yeah. access to, I think it's like four or 5 million people, plus all the reruns, plus all the online streams. You're talking about reach of six, 7 million people. There's an implied endorsement from the show, which of course isn't legally true. But people say like, oh, you're on Shark Tank. That's a big deal. You must be a good company. And so you can sort of rise above the noise in any given industry and really set yourself up for great success. Of course, that alone is not enough, right? Since the show we've raised, so we had raised $2 million at that point. We've raised $52 million in additional funding to grow this business over time. So we've been backed by amazing investors from at Los Angeles and Silicon Valley and Europe and beyond. Um, and we've hired really great people and those folks have helped us build this business. Um, and we've done a good job at, you know, providing our service at more and more scale to our customers, but it's absolutely a launch pad. And, uh, and like I said, really great people as well, always treated us and our brand and anyone I've sent their way so well. And so um, just love the platform and love the people. You know, I think 
sometimes for some products, services, and personalities, you have a big personality, it is better to be kind of not just rejected, but rejected in a huge way and then go on to have success because I think that puts the public on your side and for them, it makes for fantastic television. So <laughs> your story is a fantastic promo story for Shark Tank because if everybody who got funded was a you know was a um, you know was was a success that would be bad. So they talk about people who are not successful, things that don't work out, and also the t- the people who got talking about the people who got away is phenomenal because it shows a real life element to it as well. Yeah, and you know it's it's understandable too. I mean, and and I heard this feedback sort of after the fact, which is look, lots of people come into the Shark Tank or into any you know pitch and say, hey, this year we're doing two million dollars in sales, and next year we're going to do seven, and the year after that we're going to do twenty, and no one ever does it, and that's I mean that's the odds in any given startup, right? Any given startup, they have these massive dreams for growing the business, and most of them don't pan out, and so your odds as an investor are somewhat low, right? One in nine in 10 startups fail completely. And that, those are, that's venture backed startups. And so it's, it's good to be skeptical as a venture investor. You're not gonna put money in most things. And so I, I didn't take any personal offense to it whatsoever. And by the way, before the Shark Tank, I had been rejected by 100, 150 venture capitalists anyway. They just weren't as public and as sort of personally embarrassing, if you will, on, on national television, but I got used to it and it becomes sort of naturally part of the game your business is not going to be for everyone what you need to know is that your business is going to work and so you know founders that make it work whether they raise money or they don't know that their business is going to be successful whether it goes through these ups and downs and they all do um unless you're like an uber which is one in a billion that always goes up and to the right you're going to have those ebbs and flows in your journey whether it's shark tank rejecting you or shark tank doing a deal but then that money doesn't get you far enough or you order a bunch of product and it's bad quality, whatever it is, you're not going to just, everything going to go smoothly and it's all going to be perfect. And so really great entrepreneurs are ones with grit and with dedication and with obstinance that say, yes, this is feedback saying that you don't think this business is going to work, but I'm going to spend my time now proving you wrong or customer feedback. Hey, I don't like your service for this reason we let you down. We didn't do it good enough. I promise you we're going to do better. And you just keep churning at that and eventually you'll get where you want to go. That's great. We're talking with John Tabas. He's the founder of Books. They're the company that provides eco-friendly and sustainable flowers to you through a beautiful online platform. And now, John, I want to talk about your competitive advantage because I think your competitive advantage is exactly what a competitive advantage should be. And I know you're thrilled to hear that from me, right? Who the hell am I? But I think your competitive advantage is one that is so intriguing because it's not anything that I've ever seen before in your, in your market. Tell our, tell our folks, tell our viewers what your, what your competitive advantage is. Yeah, so at the core of, of our business is this international supply chain logistics platform. It's both the um, logistics themselves and the network that we've built up there and then the technology that powers it. And so when you think about our big competitors, FTD, who just filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, by the way, 1-800-Flowers, From You Flowers, Teleflora, these larger entities, they all rely on a network of local florists to fulfill their orders which means they have no control over what's fulfilled. Um, and, and the florist will source their flowers from a wholesaler. The wholesaler will source their flowers from an importer. The importer will source their flowers from an exporter. The exporter will source their flowers from a farmer. And so there's all these layers between the customer and where the flowers come from. And that creates a bunch of negative externalities. Um, there's between a third and half of the flowers that enter that supply chain are wasted without ever being sold. So massive economic and environmental waste. Um, they all get mixed together. So sustainable farm A and non-sustainable farm B's flowers get mixed together at lots of different points. And so there's no accountability, no transparency of sourcing. Uh, as they move through that supply chain, they get old. You know, the average flowers that move out of that supply chain into the consumer's homers between two weeks and 17 days old. 
and flowers last about three weeks. So you're just getting the last couple days of life of the flowers. Um, and so there's all these, these negative externalities, not to mention it's economically wasteful. And so the biggest differentiator for us is that we can source flowers at massive scale, extremely efficiently directly from those farms. So when you come and shop from us, you're not looking at um, some third party's collection. You're looking at what our farmers are growing at any given time. And our system is taking that millions of stems of options and turning them into bouquets, which then we're putting in front of you. And then you're gonna order those flowers and they're gonna ship either directly from a local distribution center in your, in your market, because we wanna get it to you very fast, or directly from that farm. But either way, we're sourcing it directly from that farm. So we know exactly where the flowers come from, we know when they were cut, we know how they were farmed, we can hold the farmer accountable to quality, freshness, and sustainability in a way that no one else really can. And so that is the heart and soul of our brand. It also enables us to do a bunch of things that others can't do. Because we actually are sourcing them ourselves, we can control what goes in that bouquet. So in, in the sort of traditional model, it's, it's reliant upon a third party florist that's not affiliated with the company that actually bought, that you bought your product from to be as close to the photo as possible, but there's no actual control. Um, and it made so happen that a poor local florist doesn't have any yellow lilies in stock today. And so while they'd love to give you what you ordered, they don't have it. In our system, because we control that supply chain the entire way, we actually know what we have and what we don't have, so we're not gonna sell you something we don't have. And so um, just this level of access to data and transparency in the supply chain enables us to have a very different experience. We can be very honest in the way that we market in our pricing. Um, we, can, we can give great value on a subscription basis. We'll do a dozen roses delivered for $36 with no delivery fees. That is a value that you're just not gonna find normally in the marketplace. And by the way, we can do that on Valentine's Day, at Mother's Day, at Christmas time, 365 days a year. Um, and we can do that because we control that supply chain. And so there's a whole host of benefits to the end customer because we control that entire journey of the flower from the farm to the end consumer. And that's really what sets us apart from you know, the way the industry typically works. Oh, that's terrific. So tell me a little bit about your your focus for the future now. One of the things that I've uh, I've read and I've heard about a lot is the the competitive advantage you have is that you're going directly from the you know from the as you said from the farm and you control everything. Is there a plan for you to do some sort of bricks and mortar? Is that important for your future? Um, you know, how do you view? Because a lot of a lot of online brands these days. Are moving toward uh, having a chan having a brick and mortar channel. I don't know if it's because investors want it or it's you know it's important for you to increase brand awareness with brick and mortar. Tell me about your your plans for the future and is there a brick and mortar plan for the future and if so you know why? Sure. Yeah. So I mean, high level for us, I think there's a, there's a couple interesting things sort of on the horizon. One is we continue to expand the products that we offer. So we've moved from just flowers, we obviously have vases, um, to plants, and we have premium collections. We want to be there for the customer for what they want to, want to order. We, we've done uh, candy collaborations with Sugarfina. So you'll see more of that coming where we're expanding what we can offer to the customer, both in flower varieties and depth of that catalog, but also complementary products as well. Um, subscription is a really big focus for us. Um, for, for your listeners as consumers, it's the best value. As I said, $36 delivered. You can do it every week, every other week, once a month, once every other month, or you can schedule specific dates through a tool we have that called the scheduler. So if you're forgetful, you can say mom's birthday, sister's anniversary, my, my anniversary with my wife, and we'll automatically deliver on that date every year. Because um, when, you, when you forget and you order last minute, you end up getting gouged by the industry. Um, because the later you wait, the, the higher the costs get. And so you're just going to spend a ton more money. So instead of spending $90 to $120, spend $36 and just don't stress about it. Um, so subscriptions is really important to our business. And we see that our customers love it and they're our, our, our highest value and our, our most loyal customers. So subscription is definitely a focus. Uh, bricks and mortar is interesting. So we don't have any specific plans in that space. But for e-commerce in general, as you mentioned, it's a trend. And, and I think what it is is, you know, there was this theory, you know, pretty early on, that like, oh, all the bricks and mortar stores are going to be gone, done away with because everybody's going to just take everything 100% online. And that's just not true, right? Customer behavior is such that there are certain product types and there's certain consumer behaviors that persist today where having physical stores is very helpful. 
from a brand awareness perspective, as you had mentioned, to trial and sort of touching and feeling things. If you, you're Warby Parker and you're going to buy some glasses, while they have the free buy and return program, you, some people just want to walk down the street and touch and feel and see and try on. If you're you know, a Bonobos customer and you want to try on their clothes, you can walk down to a guide shop. And so this trend of sort of omni-channel and this mixed experience, has, has, you know, Harry's did a deal with Target. Um, and, and, and at the end of the day, what that primarily comes down to, at least this is my humble opinion, is that at some point, online customer acquisition costs get inefficient. There's no company that can just spend forever and, it, and the costs stay the same. There, there's just certain truths within any marketing channel, be it Facebook or Instagram or Google or whatever it might be, that at some point, your efficiencies get to a place where you don't want to spend another dollar in that channel. And so you need another channel. And when you're Casper or Harry's or any of these brands that have gone into retail, at some point you sit there and go, hey, I don't want to spend another dollar here. What's another channel? And retail is another marketing channel. Whether you're on the shelves at Target like Harry's and, um, and Casper did to deal with Target, or if you're um, building your own shops like Bonobos, that becomes a new way to, to get brand awareness, get trial, get a consideration, and get folks to buy your product, whether it's online or in the store. And, uh, and that is more efficient. Each individual store is more efficient than one more dollar being put in online marketing. And so businesses get to that point at some point. Um, in floral, it's, it's a little different, right? Because our product is perishable. And so, you know, whereas Bonobos can stand up a store and put some inventory in there and eventually it expires because it goes out of season, they can still put it on sale and sell it wherever it might be, or they can donate it or whatever. Our flowers after X amount of time are worth zero. And so for us, it's interesting to consider, but we don't have any firm plans right now because that is a, a complexity creating value proposition, right? So, um, so it's certainly on our radar in the sense of we see this trend, um, but we also still, we feel like we have more channels that we can dive into in the online digital world. And even the things like radio, podcasts, we, we've done some advertising and TV. So we think we still have some more runway, but I think we'll continue to, to see what folks are doing and, and, and understand what the different strategies are because it is certainly interesting. Now, you're doing your own podcast. You mentioned that to me uh, pre-show. So tell me, tell me about your, what's your, what, what, what was your decision-making process to produce content and what type of content are you producing and how is that going to enable your business in the future? Yeah, so it's somewhat unrelated to Books. It, I mean, we, it's, Books is a sponsor, right? So our equipment, our space, all that comes from Books, and so we, it's a, it's a sort of a free advertising platform for the brand. Um, but uh, I mean, the primary reason was one of of sort of creative need for me, right? Companies go through cycles, and my personal um, happiness is driven by my ability to talk about and see ideas implemented. And when you're a company of five that's really easy, very quick, and it is what you do every day. You have a new idea that's implemented every single day in your first year of a, of a startup. In year two, it becomes a new idea once a week. In year three, once every other week or once a month. And by year six, which is where we are now, new ideas take months to develop and execute because you're a large, you know, we're 72 people on our way to 80. It's just not the same thing, right? You don't sort of point and click and then you have a new thing. And so as, a, as an individual, as a human being, I felt a need for a creative outlet where I didn't um, have to shepherd things through an organization. And it's not that I don't enjoy my job. I love my job. My team's amazing. I love my company, but I needed that outlet. And, and, and a podcast was a place where um, I could talk about ideas. I love ideas. I love concepts. I love business. And so we formed this podcast called Give Them the Biz. It's on, on iTunes, um, G-I-V apostrophe M, the biz. And um, we're sort of morning drive radio meets love line meets the business world. And so it's myself, uh, my co-host and producer cousin Bill, who's my real life cousin. He's a producer in, in, in Hollywood, works on a ton of reality TV shows, including the Wahlburgers most recently. And, uh, and news girl Katie Rotolo. And our sort of format is one of where we dig into to, to topics that are just sort of hot for us in the day. I have rants where I go on a, a topic about culture or about how to give feedback or whatever it might be, but in very raw, very real terms. It's not sort of corporate speak with that imaginary sheen that happens in the business world very often. It's very raw from the point of view of, of an entrepreneur. And I see these things in a day-to-day -day basis in, in our company and in the business world. And so we do, we do those types of things. 
We also have guests. We have folks like Brendan Wallace, who's the founder of the largest venture capital fund in Los Angeles. Um, we have had uh, uh, Matt Polson, who's the founder of Omaze, a whole bunch of, of really amazing guests. And then we dig into topics of the day. We dig into news, what's happening in the business world. Um, we talk about it again from a consumer perspective and sort of the, the, the thread that goes through it all is sort of, we call it startup reality and business reality. This is not an academic show. Um, it's not an interview format show, although we do have guests. It's a lot of fun. We sort of, uh, we don't take ourselves too seriously, but we take the questions we get from the audience very seriously and we just enjoy ourselves for about an hour once a week. And so it would be great if, uh, if folks would check it out. Give them the biz on, uh, on iTunes. Okay, give them the biz on iTunes. I'm sure you can find it on Spotify and Google Play, every place where you, where you get your podcast. Check out John's podcast, Give Them the Biz. John, uh, before we let you go, I'd be remiss if you didn't give, uh, if I didn't ask you to give our folks the be- best piece of sales advice you've ever you've ever received. So you're uh, you're incredibly successful in an entrepreneurial setting. You've raised a ton of money. You've built a great company so far, and it's really six years in. You're kind of just in in the in the infancy of it, really. So, what's the best piece of sales advice you've ever received? Whether it's selling yourself to get uh, to raise investment capital for your company, or you know, selling your selling your product to uh, to a you know to a group of folks who um, you know I, I see the I see the distribution you're doing um, you know now in the and the uh, the segment uh, the wedding segment that sort of thing. So tell me the best piece of sales advice you've ever received. Yeah, so you know. No one told me this, but it's certainly the, the cleanest piece of, of sales advice that I've gotten through this journey and sort of seeing what's worked and what hasn't. And at the end of the day, what you need to sell anything is you need a great story and you need hustle. If, if you have the most amazing story in the world and you're not willing to hustle and you sort of phone it in, it's never, it doesn't matter. You, you got to put in the work and none of it's easy. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we raised $54 million. I've been rejected by at least 500 venture capital. Um, at least. And I take that as a badge of honor because it means that we did the hard work to get to where we needed to go. Right. Um, and so you need to, to have, you know, the hustle part. But if you're hustling your butt off and you're not seeing results, then your story is no good. And your story can be very much dependent on whatever you're selling your product. It could be you, it could be a startup, it could be an actual product. It could be a, a, a widget, whatever it is. It could be dependent on that or not. You can have, uh, uh, you know, they always have the exercise, sell me this pen. You can have a pen and you can make a great story about that pen and make it amazingly interesting to people or not. Um, And then you can have the most interesting thing in the world, Uber, and you can create a great story for Uber or not. You have to have a great story. And so you have to have story and you have to have the hustle. And the, the easiest example I can give of this is when we were starting Books which, you know, I was running around town trying to get this thing off the ground and trying to sell people on it. And I wasn't getting the reaction I was looking for because I thought what we had was amazing. Like we're going to ship flowers from international farms to you. It's going to be fresh. It's going to be sustainable. And I was pitching it with all those different benefits, you know, Hey, labor, we make sure that all the labor is really well treated. That's really nice. You know, that's fine. Uh, We get these flowers like, they're super fresh. Yeah, that's cool. You know, it was very tepid responses. And I kept iterating on it, kept iterating on it. And in a meeting once, we started talking about this volcano where we sourced the flowers from called Kayambe. And all of a sudden, one of the guys in the room goes, whoa, 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 wait, what's the volcano? Like, the vol- we've been in here for a half an hour. You've not even once mentioned this volcano. I was like, well, yeah, it's called Kayambe. It's where my co-founder lives. It's where the, a lot of the farms are. And he's like, that's the coolest thing ever. Why have you not told me about this volcano? And it was like, boom, we're books.com. We drop ship flowers from an active volcano in South America for $40 flat. And all of a sudden, everyone cared, right? It was the exact same product. It was the exact same business, but we found the story. And so for the next two years, all we talked about was this freaking volcano. Volcano flowers, volcano flowers, pictures of volcanoes on the website, emails, Everything was about the volcano and we watched it take off. We got PR out of that Oprah magazine. Um, We were a a prize on the price is right, Shark Tank. All this stuff started to happen because we had a great story and then I hustled the heck out of that story. And so if you wanna sell something, your product can be great or terrible, it kinda doesn't matter. 
You need to have an amazing story that makes people, when you say it, lean in and go, whoa, 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 I need to know more. If that's not their response, then your story is no good and you got to keep trying until you figure it out. And there's always a story. There's, it, there's nothing that you can't build an amazing story around. And so find your story and hustle the heck out of it. That's my sales advice. That's awesome. That is, uh, that is very consistent with what I teach folks and it's very consistent with what my experience has been over the years and I'm sure it's consistent with the experience that our, our viewers and listeners have had. Folks, we'd spent the last 30 minutes talking with John Tavis. He's the CEO and founder of The Books Company and they deliver fresh flowers to you from the side of a volcano and you can go to their website, books.com, B-O-U-Q-S, Dot com. And I also want you to check out D- John's podcast. And the name of the podcast is Give Him the Biz. You can find it on iTunes. Here's the thing. One of, if you go to, if you watch the Dave Lorenzo Daily on YouTube, you'll find that I advocate keeping in touch with people on a regular basis. I talk about doing weekly email newsletters, doing monthly print newsletters. I do a daily show on YouTube that's distributed. We do these weekly interviews. We distribute them to 100,000 people via email. There is nothing better than sending your best clients a fresh bouquet of flowers every month. I mean, can you imagine what your clients would think if flowers just showed up at their office once a month and they could put them in their lobby, they could put them in the waiting room, they could put them in their office? Uh, Books has a subscription model that allows you to do this one time and then you can forget about it. And it's 40 bucks. I mean, come on, 40 bucks a month to take care of your best client. It's absolutely ridiculous. I want you guys to give this a, give this a shot and I want to hear in the comments how it went. Leave the comments down on the YouTube channel. Leave the comments on iTunes. Tell me how this has changed your relationship with your clients because I can almost guarantee that it will. John, it's been a uh, fantastic privilege having you on today. I could talk to you about entrepreneurship, about branding, about marketing, about sales for hours and hours. I am uh, thrilled that you were able to join us. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me and and appreciate all the time. And and thanks to you and to all the listeners for, for spending a little bit of time learning about flowers today. All right, folks, that'll do it for another episode of the Do This Sell More show. We're here every Thursday, every Thursday at noon. Please join us again next Thursday. Until then, here's hoping you do this and sell more. I'm Dave Lorenzo. Have a fantastic week.